I wanted this next generation to one, learn about these crimes. It is an educational piece. Um, it's not preparing you to be that, but I think that horror has a responsibility and an opportunity to educate as well as entertain. So I used that in this. And then I want, next time you see, you know, a Ted Bundy tattoo, I want you to have to think about looking in the eyes of these women in this movie, knowing what he did to them, and then see if it seems as cool. Today we are joined with the horror queen on and off the screen, Devony Pin. Over the last decade, you may have seen her face prevailing as the final girl or getting absolutely slaughtered in some of the most famous, fun, and campiest horror movies from Piranha 3D, The Flood, The Dawn, and pretty much anything with like a three-headed shark. She's even killed our boy Danny Trejo with a chainsaw. But beyond all the awesome stuff she does on the screen, we're here to talk about her brand new film that she directed and produced called The Black Mass, which is actually based off a true crime case and one of the most notorious serial killers we know. But what is extra cool about this was she didn't make it known in the trailer and told an isolated incident in this real life case that often gets overshadowed. She intentions to honor both the victims and the survivors of this horrific act. We really appreciated the film and got an extra appreciation hearing all the layers behind it. So yeah, let's get right into it. Hi, Devony. How are you? Great, happy Sunday to you. Thank you to you as well. <laughs> yeah, really, uh, really great to meet you uh, this morning. I've actually watched uh, The Black Mass and was like viewing on Sunday morning, huh? Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I was about to say that was so it was like such a fun movie, but I don't know if that's like the right word or what relates to my psychology since it's like based on a true story and everything. But uh, yes. yeah, overall, it was just like so well done. And even before I yeah. dive in the movie, it was cool to like kind of uh, see your resume and like over the past decade plus, you're kind of like the on-screen horror queen right now. And, <laughs> and I just kind of want to know what inspired you to take an extra step to produce a project of your own. Uh, so this is actually the 14th or 15th feature that I produced. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, yeah. So I've been producing since early in my career. Um, I, I was kind of always nosy as an actress on set. I would be, you know, preparing for my scene and then I'd be like to the lighting guy, I'd be like, Hey, what does this do? And then I got the sound guy. I'm like, Hey, what does this button do? So I was always annoying all the crew on set trying to find out what their jobs were. I was just fascinated by production from, um, from the beginning. And so eventually um, I ended up kind of finding like-minded filmmaker actors. And at the time I wasn't very popular to do that, but we kind of just all uh, formed a group and started, producing our own our own movies um because we were also genre fans so we kind of knew what what we wanted to see and what we wanted to create um from there i i never really had directing as uh, aspirations i always i love acting and i love producing because i get to build the world that i'm in um so that's kind of fun but i i never really sought out to direct um until it came to this project i had the opportunity uh thanks to cleopatra who who are um, the producers, financiers on this, they um, they were really supportive of me kind of jumping behind the lens. I was so um, particular on what I wanted this movie to be and how I wanted it to be executed that um, I really felt like to get exactly the story I wanted, um, I needed to do it myself. Yeah, that's so awesome. And it's cool to hear how you built this community and just it seems like it's just such a natural progression of like not only like just being in this industry, but like just to push your passions to another level and like challenge yourself and everything. Yes, very much so. Um, it was challenging, but very, very rewarding. I think it's um, I always encourage actors to uh, step behind the camera in some capacity. They can learn like the various jobs that happen on sex. I think it makes you a stronger performer to have that understanding. You know, if you know what light they're putting up, you know where to angle your face. If you know what lens the director is using, you know what your frame is. So it just really 
arms you with information to do better at your job. And I think it's uh, the same if you are behind the camera. I think you should always be in front of the camera at least once so you understand what you're asking of the performers. And having that knowledge and that that um, complete understanding of your world, I think, allows you to do your very, very best work. And so um, it was a long time coming, but I, I feel like I learned so much um, in directing this project. And I, I feel very... Um, very thankful, I guess it's kind of a cheesy way to say it, but I, I really am. I, I'm, I really felt strongly about this particular crime case and the people involved in it. And I was thankful for an opportunity to kind of shed some long overdue light on them. Mm -hmm. um, and so to jump behind the, the lens and direct my first project, I think it's just an incredibly rewarding story to be able to put out there and tell and i'm just so grateful that people are responding to it yeah that's awesome and kudos and i can imagine too like <laughs> you being behind the lens too that's got to be helpful for the actors you're working with because you know what it's like to be in their shoes and maybe you can say things in a different way that they'll understand where maybe in certain cases a director who's never been in front of the camera like doesn't really get or would never get unless you had that experience it's absolutely the case. Um, so I don't want to speak to my actors. Uh, they, they're they very involved in the film, so they can speak for themselves. But um, they have told me they really, really appreciated how I handled uh, the approach with them and, and the material itself. And I know because I've done sensitive material. I've done really physically and emotionally demanding material. So I know what I hoped I could get from my director when I'm leaning on them. And I know um, kind of what the challenges are because I've been in their shoes. So I was trying to be very uh, sensitive to that and, and anticipate the needs for that um, because it was such uh, sensitive material um, with these stories, you know, not only just with them being as demanding as they are on the performer, but then also them being real people whose stories we're telling. Um, we just all felt an additional responsibility to get it right. Uh, and so I think, you know, having absolutely been in their shoes, we were really able to um, get to the heart of it um, efficiently and quickly. And and it was just, uh, I guess they, they they refer to it being an actor's director. Some people a little more on the technical side of things um, and some people a little bit more working with the actors. And I always think the most interesting stories, especially in horror where it kind of ends up being gimmicky a lot of the time, I think the stuff that really impacts people the most are human stories. Mm -hmm. and yeah, so definitely. yeah, yeah. And uh, I think it's cool, like just your vision and approach with this movie. Uh, basically like, I find a lot of times when you watch a movie on true crime or one of these famous like serial serial killers, they try to tell the whole journey where this is him as a kid and this is him like at the end of his life. And I like how you took an isolated incident, like maybe just Ted Bundy on a weekend doing his thing or whatever, yeah. and just focused on this one story. I felt like it just made like such like a, a tight presentation of everything and got you like really locked into the moment. That's that's so crazy about it is this this movie's been like or excuse me this the story's been told a lot it's been heavily covered in the media it's been covered in Hollywood you know and I just never it never sat right to me that these poor people who were horrifically impacted in their lives and unwillingly showcased in pop culture for decades are just literally like a two or three minute blip in this monster story. Yeah. They didn't even get to be the forefront in their own attacks and murders. Um, it just always bothered me to my core. And I said, they're, you know, not to say it's a fascinating story, but it was such an eventful 24 hours and such um, it really just almost seemed made for television that, that this this 24 hour rain happened so everything that you see in the movie is not fabricated all based on actual facts so he really went to the store that day he really went to that club and that bar that night so all of oh, the things shit. that happened in that those are literally it's almost a timeline of that 24 hours and it was not only fascinating from a true crime perspective it was such an emotional powerful uh, chain of events what, what happened with the the stalking and and attack of these poor young girls that I really felt like if nothing else they get to to 
star in their story for once. They get to let people know who they were, what they were. They were, you know, they're not a number on on a serial killer's bedpost. They are real people, real women, real families, friends, sisters, you know, who were going about their day and had no idea what was, none, what was coming for them. What was so um, impactful to me is nowadays we kind of know monsters exist, right? We know about the psychology of, of serial killers and criminals who have, you know, extreme antisocial personalities. But at that time, this is the case that literally coined the phrase serial killer. Wow. It did not exist until this chain of events. So these, and you know, this was a time where you didn't lock your doors. You know, it, there was there was nothing known to be afraid of. So when you think of one minute you're, you know, going to work and doing your laundry and preparing for, you know, midterms, coming back from, from winter break, the next minute an unimaginable, unknown to society kind of evil literally comes at your face it was just you know the the incredible incredible chain of events that these women endured and um and some survived and some succumbed to was so 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 intense i thought it was important to take a moment and really experience what they went through because these women are heroic on on a, a level that was not even known and I just think that was so important to showcase. Wow. So much respect to you. It's so cool to hear like all the layers that went into like mentally preparing this piece and where yeah. I was going in blindly just expecting, oh, it's just going to be like a murder thing. Like I saw like yeah. a clip of the trailer and like I was thinking, oh, it's like all the cliche things, but it actually wasn't. And I thought another thing was cool. Like you, also you mentioned like a lot of these real stories, they are being told as like a blip of like a big picture where yes. again, like I didn't know the isolated incident of this too. I, just, I but I know Ted Bundy, you know, and right. I think it's, um, kind of even great what you did at the end credits of like almost the aftermath of the surviving girls. And yeah. also I didn't know they started like this support group and stuff like that. And it's just, it's, uh, it's amazing. Like, uh, I it was like an educational piece where, where I yes. didn't expect it, you know, <laughs> like yes. I thought I was going to watch exactly, a slasher flick, you know, <laughs> that's exactly what it was yeah. supposed to be. So we were um, a little bit more gentle uh, in the marketing of this. So we never said uh, Bundy's name in the initial, and, and I toured around the world with this for a year before it came out. We never said his name because he has so much attention in the media. It was literally the point of the film to take the spotlight away from him and put it on these girls. Nice. So we didn't market it as a Bundy piece. And I knew like pretty much everybody in the world knew his name, but no one could name a single victim. And that rubbed me the wrong way. So I was um, I was doing a lot of horror conventions. I'm, you know, I'm an actress in horror movies. I was meeting a lot of fans. And I kept, when I would go to these conventions, I kept seeing um, people with Bundy merchandise, T-shirts, cups. And, you know, I was like, these people don't know who he really was, what yeah. he really did to people. Because despite constant portrayals of him in the media and in Hollywood, it was always watered down to like, oh, he's hot. Oh, he's suave. Oh, he, you know, they glossed over the intensity of his mental illness and, and sexual fetish because it's uncomfortable to think about. So all the people really knew about him, especially in this next generation, was, you know, he's a trendy serial killer. It was like cool to be yeah. a fan of his. So I wanted, I wanted this next generation to one, learn about these crimes. It is an educational piece. Um, it's not preparing you to be that, but I think that horror has a responsibility and an opportunity to educate as well as entertain. So I used that in this. And then I want, next time you see, you know, a Ted Bundy tattoo, you know, I want you to have to think about looking in the eyes of these women in this movie knowing what he did to them and then see if it seems as cool uh, respect to you Devin. and it's so true like even like people i find like they get especially like young horror fans are so disconnected to these cases and yeah, again it's, it's, it's just, not their fault 
It's not yeah. their fault. It's how we portray them. So hopefully this will start to make you think differently about not only this case, but all cases. When you see shooters on the news, when you see, you know, people attacking and you're in just unfortunately in the day to day life. Hopefully you won't immediately think like, oh, who's the killer? Hopefully you'll think about the people whose lives are forever changed from the events. Mm-hmm, it's just yeah. a, it's a deprogramming of society and how we handle these cases. Yeah, it's almost like they mentally put him in a box, like as a character, like a Freddy or yes. Jason. And they're like, yeah, 100%. it's cool, but it's not like this is like something that happened and people are suffering and like their parents are like their families are still probably suffering. Yes. Like, you know, so it's uh, yeah, that's a very, very, very important. But, message. but we don't think about it that way. And it's not it's not society's fault that we don't think about it that way. It just literally nobody um, that I've spoken to and I've talked to a lot of people over the last year with this movie, nobody set out to um idolize or pop culturize the, this this killer they didn't mean to overlook the victims it's just how we are programmed to kind of respond to these cases it's entertainment and there's a very big wall that we put up in our psyche to make it safe to enjoy as entertainment we really dehumanize everybody involved so this is you know it's kind of gift wrapped as a fun cliche slasher movie but it is a deep dive into psychologically how we're approaching this kind of material and hopefully thinking of it differently and so I'm sorry to everybody who wanted a quick little entertainment piece. This no, so this bad. is awesome. <laughs> this, this is great. Devin, thank you so much for breaking down the layers, too. It's like, yeah. uh, I wanted to say, like, I appreciated the movie and it's cool. Like, I'm even appreciating even more hearing, like, the work and thought and um, even overall intention you put into this piece, which is yeah. super cool. And even I wanted to say, um, like, watching it, too, it is a 70s piece. And aesthetically, yeah. I thought you fucking nailed it with the music and uh, just the cars and everything and I gotta imagine as directing something like in the modern times to do a piece like that happened in the 70s that must be such a pain of just like triple checking oh, making sure things yeah. like aren't out of place and everything but it was so much work <laughs> I, I I feel very validated because a lot of people have noticed the attention to detail to the era so I'm like okay all that blood sweat and tears was worth it but we really like not only just me my whole team really really went like uh, ridiculously above and beyond to try to make sure it was as historically accurate as possible so the locations look the way they did really that day um everything down to like the glasses they were holding, the little things they interact with, the outfits, the way everything is period appropriate and very, very close to or spot on for the actual day. Because it was so important for this movie to work that you really felt like you were going through this day with these people. Otherwise, it really would be kind of like just a cheesy period slasher movie. So um, we worked really, really hard. The music, Fernando Perdoma, who um, I worked with on the last movie on this team, Frost, um, we brought him back on this because I think he just really understands the era um and the the feeling that music can give to you uh when you're embodying this kind of a piece and this kind of an era and i think that he just nailed it so everybody involved uh the cars that are period appropriate let me just tell you how difficult on a budget was to find a period appropriate ambulance and police car yeah that work <laughs> actually too that our working condition it was yeah. like it was, so there's just lots and lots of little things like that you know trying to find you know not only a house that was film friendly would allow you to be the the scene of a crime for you know ted bundy's murderous rampage but then to have it look like all the crime scene photo there's just so much that went into it it was you know really a long, long time with lots of prep work and planning, but I am, I'm so proud of what we were able to do with it, especially on limited budget. And, and my team was just, just awesome. Yeah, really was. You should definitely be proud too. One thing I loved was when he processed his credit card and I forgot that's like the old way to do it. And I remember when I was a kid, I used to work at the store and they had that there and they're like, Oh, if the machine ever goes down, you got to use it. And it get, kind of gave me PTSD you, because like one day it actually went down and I did it and I did it wrong. And they're just like, oh, like you cost. Us what like- it, it, it's so, you know, it's really funny. Like yeah. I felt massively old because um, my actress who makes the phone call to call her bookstore um, for books for her classes. She was like, what is this? And I'm mm-hmm. like, what? And she's like, what do I do? She didn't know what a rotary phone was she's actually like 20 years old so i had to show her how you make a phone call on the rotary 
That's awesome. I know me and you were both in our thirties and we saw like the last, the death of <laughs> rotary phones, but maybe at our grandma's house or whatever, but yeah, that's so yeah, cool. So there's a lot of creepy technology like that, that we had to source and even educate people on. So um, in that capacity, I love, like I love nostalgia and I love period pieces. I'm like kind of a nerd in that way because I really like history. So for me, like finding those individual props, the the phones, the phone booths, the cars, just the you know the technology that didn't exist. It was all um, really fun in that capacity. I hate I hate to say that this movie was fun, but there were some moments that were mm -hmm. were rewarding in that way. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's so cool. And even like I know this movie's out right now. I think this is going to be the fastest turnaround I've done on an episode. Usually record and like put it out like a couple weeks around like the the stuff but i think i'm gonna get this out tomorrow try to get the word out and everything awesome thank you yeah. so much i really appreciate that yeah we so we did so much leading up to it that like when it came down to the release like we were all a little like burnt out and you know if you, as you can imagine it's really heavy material so to like consistently talk about it for a year we were all like I, I need a breather so we wanted to just take you know this week to to celebrate the accomplishment of getting it out um to people and hopefully people respond to it we we did really well. Like um, the the day it came out, we we got to number two on Amazon and horror and um, it's sold out. So they're restocking it right now. And um, people are kind of seeking it out on their own and the word of mouth is kind of traveling on it. So it's really great. And I just I hope people will will watch it so we can start to have these kind of conversations. That's really the intention behind the movie. And I so appreciate you having me on to help continue the conversation. Oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Congrats on like the momentum with it and everything, too. And even before. <laughs> Before we go, I got another question for you. Just yeah. more on like your acting life, like and even like <laughs> I see like your resume, the films you've been in, just the legacy of being either the final girl or just murdered by alligators, sharks, creatures, yeah. and all this. And I want to know, like, do you have a favorite like murder scene or like something you got in a way you got killed or something you think is like the coolest? I know there's like a lot, like it's over a decade of catalog but <laughs> yeah it's so um i don't know if it came out there was one movie i did where um it was an unintentional horror comedy that i did that literally uh a a jealous teenage girl kidnapped um, me and my friends from high school and fed us twinkies <laughs> until our heads blew up and exploded <laughs> That was probably a favorite. Um, I got eaten by by a two headed shark. That was pretty awesome too. Um, and then I guess probably the ultimate would have to be um, Piranha 3D. Was mm -hmm. it was a big one. Was because it's literally the biggest slaughter in cinematic history and um i i got hired to just be like one of the wet t-shirt girls on the stage and during spring break but when they found out that i could die well it was the beginning of my mm -hmm. career um alex aja the director he literally like sent all the rest of the girls home and was like stay for an extra two weeks so i die like six or seven times all over the massacre <laughs> in different places so it's like there's like a drinking game now if you can spot me in the different parts of the, the massacre Just changing your hair and stuff yes. like oh, that's so cool yes so yeah. that was really cool so i got to die over and over and over and over again and they're literally in a slaughter of like a thousand students so that was super Super. I don't know if I can curse in this. Super cool. Oh, you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> That's I, love awesome. it. I, I literally like when I sign on to a movie, the first thing I ask is like, do I die? And people are always like, well, yes, but here's the thing. And I always tell them, good, I'll do it because I don't like to live. I, I know that's weird in, in yeah. horror movies. I, I love special effects, um, especially physical special effects. Um, and I love doing death scenes. So if regardless what the movie is if you have a really really cool death scene in it i will do it every single time nice respect so devany i love your spirit that's awesome yeah <laughs> i know um you got like another interview right after this in a few minutes but i just want to thank you for your time and um, thank you yeah i this felt like I could, uh, awesome i'm glad you had a good time too <laughs> like i still feel like i can ask you a million questions so hopefully around your next project we can like uh, do another one of these 
I would absolutely love, please keep in touch. I'm, I'm very, very active on social media. I love talking to fellow horror nerds. So, uh, so whether it's you or anyone watching this, please, I'm happy to continue the chats and um, thank you for, for watching my stuff and hopefully this movie. And I'm definitely looking forward to coming back on, hopefully with more time and, and just chatting all things spooky for sure. Hell yeah. Appreciate that. Definitely going to keep in touch and uh, yeah, hope you have a good day and have some fun interviews as well. Like, Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, Bye cheers. Guys. Take care. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that talk with Devony e. Pin right now. The Black Mass is available on Blu-ray DVD in multiple streaming services. I thoroughly enjoyed this chat, and it seems like Devony e. had a good time too. Felt like there was so much I could talk about, even beyond this film, and a lot of cool shit in her career. And I'm sure you'll be hearing her voice on one of these segments sometime in the future. And before we go, like always, we can't leave without thanking all you ledges on the Patreon page. Appreciate you guys so much supporting the show. And first up, the biggest thanks to Mike Carniello of the Testing with Mike YouTube channel. If you're into electronics, technology, how they work, and most importantly, how to fix them, check out Testing with Mike on YouTube. Another big thanks to Amanda McKnight of Top 10 Nerd. Not only is she the host of Top 10 Nerd talking to millions of subscribers, Amanda has her very own YouTube channel that I recommend you checking out and soaking in those good vibes and learning about comic books, video games, movies, and all things nerdy. That's Amanda McKnight on YouTube. Another big thanks to the wonderful Jenny Potter, the legend Devin McBride. The number one gent, Alan frickin' Kent. And big wig, Alan Briggs. Shout out to Alan for joining the Patreon. And not only joining the Patreon, getting one of the upper tiers and spending a little extra money over here. Dude, I appreciate you so much. And another thanks to our favorite soul singer, Saber. And last but not least, Francis Coffer, a.k.a. My Mom. If you want to shout out at the end of every one of these episodes and also get these episodes raw, uncut, early, right when I'm done the Zoom call, I just post them. You can go to patreon.com slash the creative imbalance and beyond having my thanks, you can just go to bed at night and sleep soundly knowing you're a badass motherfucker who supports raw, uncut, independent media and nobody can take that away from you. You hear me? With that being said, we got so many great episodes coming around the corner. I don't know if you noticed, but we've been on a tear and it's not stopping. So stay tuned and we'll catch you next time. Mwah.